Thank you. Alrighty. Okay, well, I'm glad everybody's here. It's it's neat to get some people from around the world, and I appreciate your questions. I had a couple questions already on the forum, so feel free to ask those. Um, so about five years ago, I worked on a, a project that was a 12-channel a Ethernet-controlled battery charger. It was about 160 watts per channel, and it would also discharge the batteries at about 30 watts per channel, which is completely going into heat. It didn't we didn't have anything else to do with that power. So we had 30 watts of heat on each one of these battery chargers. And if you put that times 12, we had 360 watts of heat on each one of these chassis uh, chargers that we had. I was sure we were gonna need some sort of serious heat sinks and fans for that kind of power. But my mechanical engineer assured me we could heat sink to the chassis and it was gonna be no problem. Well, <laughs> that was not true. He unfortunately did not do his homework. The first prototype heated, uh, overheated really badly, and we had to put a whole lot of more fans and a whole lot of more studies. We ended up delaying the project by, I think, a month or two. So this kind of class is designed for, for all of you people who are facing similar situations so that you don't have to go through the pain that I went through. This is just kind of a nice little screenshot of a thermal image uh, of a PCB. You can see the, the dye inside the ICs. It's really neat. You can see the hot spots on the board. Very handy. You can see these resistors are uh, running much hotter than the rest of the board. Uh, in my full day class, I go over tools and uh, the infrared, the imager is really a great tool to have to use. It's very handy. As, as Lucy mentioned, this class is a greatly shortened version of my half day class that will be in January. All right, so real quick, I'm gonna go over the outline. Why do we care about temperature? We're gonna talk about physics. We're gonna talk about semiconductor cons uh, construction and heat. And then we're gonna talk about how we can spread that heat out using PCB techniques in uh, surface mount specifically. Then we're gonna go over a few practical thermal guidelines. It's a popular notion that for every 10 degrees C temperature rise, semiconductors wear out twice as fast. I don't know how many of you have heard that. This is based on the Arrhenius Henius equation. I don't know how to pronounce that. Which is to describe chemical reactions. And uh, basically, it's true. We can't say absolutely that this is always going to be true for every device, because of course there are multiple of different kinds of failures. Some failures will be uh, in packaging, some failures will be in on the silicon. We can always say that cooler electronics will last much longer on average. Clearly this LDO will not last too long. Uh, whoops, wrong one. Okay, so um, the mean time between failure is proportional to EC over T. So where T is the operating temperature of the system in Kelvin and C is the specific uh, system specific constant that you can calculate. There's a number of good equations on the military sites specifically about reliability. They talk about uh, lots of different components and how they work together. They also talk about this equation. As temperature decreases, of course, reliability will increase. The benefits to lower temperatures are things like less temperature cycling, and of course, that means less mechanical stress because as your devices heat up, they will expand. As your PCB heats up, it will expand. And every time you turn it off and it cools down, it will contract. So over time, you'll get separation of things that have high differences in their expansion and contraction rates. And that's one reliability problem. Of course, we all know that the system will operate in uh, higher ambient temperatures. If it runs lower as uh, an operating temperature, you'll have much better reliability. But the overall goal is that your junction temperature, meaning the temperature inside this device, this is a, an LDO, the temperature inside here, the junction temperature on the silicon should remain lower than the maximum data sheet. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here, but I'm pointing at this overheating device. Yes, we can. Okay, good. 
All right, before we talk about how to get rid of the heat, let me briefly touch on the best solution to thermal management. Design matters, cost versus efficiency. There's probably a more expensive way to do what you do that's more efficient. But maybe you haven't considered that because it's too expensive. But when you look into thermal management, you realize that it is not cheap. It's actually fairly expensive to put a fan in your system, to put a big heat sink in your system. So think about ways to stop making heat in the first place. And this is kind of a funny, funny way to look at thermal management, but it would be best if you didn't have to manage anything, right? Heat related. It would be best if you didn't make that heat in the first place. So think about uh, cost versus efficiency trade-off. Power supplies, for example. LDOs are great, they're cheap, they're quiet, but are they the best solution for your system? A buck or a, a, a switching regulator is gonna be more money, but it also be more efficient. So you may be able to avoid some heat management by spending a little more money up front, and you may end up with a cheaper solution overall. MOSFETs are a great example too. You can spend a little more money and you can lower your resistance and that will reduce the amount of heat that you have to take away. Inductors, the same way, spend a little more money, make a little less heat. AC power handling can be similar. All the above can reduce the heat. So you may end up not having to put a fan in your system. You may end up not having to put uh, heat sinks. So that would, that would save you a lot of money overall. So I just wanted to bring that up quickly because it's worth thinking about. So um, let's go to the basics, physics. Uh, I know you guys all remember this from high school. <laughs> in this case, the heat in has to equal the heat out. Otherwise, your temperature is going to go higher and higher and higher until the heat in does equal the heat out or until it bursts into flames. <laughs> None of us want that. So barring some conversion of heat into uh, some other type of energy, there's got to be an equilibrium. Now I'm talking about heat power. I'm not talking about electrical power. So for example, if you've got a power supply that's 400 watts, that's not 400 watts of heat. That's 400 watts of power. The actual heat would be 400 watts times the inefficiency of the regulator of the power supply. So let's say you've got a 90% um, efficient regulator that would be 40 watts of heat you would have to handle because 10% of that 90% is inefficiency, which is gonna equal heat. If your processor is generating five watts of heat, it's got to dissipate five watts of heat out regardless of the ambient temperature and environment. So the ultimate goal of thermal management is for electronics to transfer all the heat in the air. And it's kind of funny to think about, all the heat has to go in the air. No matter what happens, it can go in the chassis, it can go into the case. All the heat has to go into the air at some point. So the key is how do we get a large enough area to conduct this heat into the air with the airflow that we have? Now, this is, of course, not true if you're doing some sort of underwater thing. But in general,